Now tonight is another one of those hectic topics and it's titled They Have Made Void Thy Law and in Psalms 119 we read It's time for thee, Lord, to work for they have made void thy law. So mankind is in rebellion against God and rebellion means that you rebel against the rules and the regulations or as Alistair Crowley of the rock scene fan would say, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law. We violate the law of God on many levels. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 5 says, The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they have transgressed the laws. They've changed the ordinances and they've broken the everlasting covenant. That's what brings defilement. And there are so many interesting theologies today that the law is no more. We are under grace and therefore we are not under the law because Paul speaks about under the law and under grace and then one could become confused if one reads him out of context. The Bible also says where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if there is no law, then there is no transgression. Do I then need grace? No. If there's no transgression, then I don't need grace. I only need grace if I'm a transgressor. Then I need law. Or mean I need grace because I'm a transgressor of the law. So Paul also says, do I thereby make void the law through grace? God forbid I uphold or establish the law. So let's have a look at some of these issues. Now last night we looked at the attributes of the little horned power who the reformers claimed was the papal system. And one of the attributes was that this power would think to change times and laws. So it would mess with God's times and it would mess with God's laws. Now the question of course is, did he do it? Because if the reformer said it was the, the Roman system, then we have to ask the question, did he do it? Well, let's first ask him, if he has the power to do it, or if he thinks he has the power to do it. And this is their own quote, and it says, the Pope has power to change times and to abrogate, that's to get rid of, laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. A pretty powerful man, don't you think? Very powerful man. So he claims he can do it. The Roman Decretalia say he can pronounce the Pope sentences and judgments in contradiction to the rights of nations, to the law of God and man. He can free himself from the commands of the apostles, he being their superior, and from the rules of the Old Testament. It seems to me he's above the law. Now, why would he be able to say such a thing? Here's another quote. Pope Nicholas said, The Pope's will stands for reason. That's why he can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing laws. So based on his reason, he can change laws. Even God's laws. Even the precepts of Christ. Now doesn't the Bible say Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever? And doesn't the Bible also say, I'm the Lord, I change not? Now, 2 Thessalonians, we read a lot about what Paul said about this issue. He said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the coming of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first. So there's going to be a problem. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition 
who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God so that he, so that, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the reformer said, this temple was the church. He's sitting in the church and taking the place of God. Now, how do you take the place of God? Well, if God is in control, then God is the one who sets the standards and God makes the rules and the norms and the laws. Isn't that right? If a new government takes over and they dispense with what went before and make new rules and new laws and enforce them, then who's the governing power? The new one, isn't it so? So if he decides to change laws and change God's laws, well, then he is taking the position of God and setting the precepts. And this is predicted there in the New Testament. So let's first say, what is sin? Because he's called the man of sin. Well, here's the definition of sin in the Bible, 1 John 3, 4. Whoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if I break the law, I sin. What if I say, I'm going to change the law and get rid of the old one, make my own one, even if it's contrary to the previous one? Am I not breaking God's law, yes or no? So is the title, man of sin, appropriate? If he does that, must be. So let's first ask the question, did Rome change God's law? Now here's the law of God as it appears in the Bible, and here is the law of God as it appears in the official catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, the one that has the stamp of approval by Pope John Paul II himself. The first commandment says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The catechism says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me. Sounds just like an abbreviation, but it's more than that. What's left out? This is left out. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's gone. So, what do we have now? And if the change is based on reason, then what, what is the reason why we change it? Now the answer is quite simple. If you want to have a universal franchise, if you want to be universally accepted as the leader of the religious world, then you have a problem if you're dealing with a very specific deity. Now the deity here is the one that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. That one. That one. Whereas here, it's not the one who brought them out of Egypt. That's gone. So this is a very specific deity, and it says, you shall have no other gods before me. And this one is a very generic deity. Because who is he? Could be anyone. Right? So this could satisfy a Hindu, this could satisfy a Muslim. This could satisfy a Christian. This could satisfy a shaman. This could satisfy a Satanist. Doesn't matter. There's no specific deity mentioned. Now the second commandment in the Bible says, Thou shalt not make for thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or that is in the earth beneath, that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of their fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, we can misinterpret that verse and say that God hates and God visits iniquity. But the Bible also says that the sins of the fathers may not be transferred to the children and vice versa. Each one has to stand for his own sins. But what is a reality is that certain sins run in families. 
the example set normally takes a while to filter out of a family. And it's interesting that there's a new science in the world which is called epigenetics. And epigenetics is the controlling system of your genetic makeup. And it's interesting that they found out that inherited character traits are actually transferable because the epigenetics, the software of your genetic system, maintains them, and guess for how long? Until the third and fourth generation. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. But would you agree that this commandment is against idolatry? You're not allowed to have images. You're not allowed to bow down to them. You're not allowed to incorporate them in your worship in any sense. Would this be a problem in Buddhism, for example? Would it be a problem in Hinduism if you had to adhere to this commandment? For that matter, would it be a problem in Catholicism? All right. So tell me now, what is easier? To change the mindset of the entire world or to remove the commandment? What would be easier? This commandment is in the way. It's a problem commandment. You have to change the way society operates and thinks. So the best thing you can do with this commandment, as far as the papacy is concerned, is take it away. It doesn't exist. So now they have how many commandments? Nine. Sounds a bit stupid to talk about the nine commandments. So somehow they will have to rectify that, and we'll see how they do it. So Rome just removes the second commandment. Gone. The third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. This is now their second commandment because they're running one behind. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What's gone? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Now, I can assure you that every single stroke of a pen that Rome puts to paper has been well thought through. Very well thought through. Why would they remove this admonition of God? Why would they remove it? Well, it simply works like this. If you have a law, and the law is under the authority of the governing body, then that governing body has the right to declare penalty to any transgression of that law. Is that correct? Now let's assume there is such a law and a new governing body takes over and incorporates some of the laws of the previous governing body, but all admonitions by the previous government would have to be removed. Why? or else the authority would still be vested in the previous one. Let me give you a simple example. South Africa had many laws. Some of the laws were offensive. Some of the laws were not offensive. They were normal statutes and laws that any country would have. And now let's say South Africa had a law, and for each law they prescribed a penalty or a warning. Now a new government takes over and says we are not interested in the authority of the previous government. In fact, we're going to look at its law structure and we're going to scrap this law, we're going to scrap that one, we're going to scrap this one. Oh, and here's an admonition as to what they will do if, what, when and where. We'll take that out because they are no longer the authority. We are the authority. So this is because of authority. Now the authority has been removed from this lawgiver. This one is the new lawgiver. The fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor 
thy son or thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, cattle, stranger within your gates. For, why? In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in the mees, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's interesting that the second commandment and the fourth commandment are the longest commandments in the Bible. The Roman Catholic Catechism has reduced it to remember to keep holy the Lord's day. So what's gone? <laughs> Virtually all of it. And then there's something else that's also different. Have you noticed it? It says there, remember the Sabbath day, so we'll have to take that out and change it to the Lord's day. All right? So the commandment looks totally different. Now, why were you to keep this commandment according to the law as it stands? You're not allowed to do this, that, this, who, what, all explained. Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in the is, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it, he made it holy. That's why you must keep this law. Because he's your creator and he says so. And to hallow it means he wants to fill it with himself. So he wants to spend quality time with you. Now, why would you keep this commandment? Let's ask them. This is the Father Maguire's New Baltimore Catechism and Mass of 1949. And here they will explain how this law works and why. And by the way, this has the uh, stamp of approval of the Archbishop of New York, who is the highest Knight of Malta in America, and therefore the highest bishop in America. All right, so why do we keep this command? What is the third commandment of God? This is the catechism. The third commandment of God, remember, thou keep holy the Lord's day. Why does the church command us to keep Sunday as the Lord's day? The church commands us to keep Sunday as the Lord's day because on Sunday Christ rose from the dead and on Sunday the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles. Firstly, who commands here? Is it God or the church? Is it the church? What are we commanded by the third commandment? By the third commandment, we are commanded to worship God in a special manner on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Uh, let's continue. How does the church command us to worship God on Sunday? The church commands us to worship God on Sunday by assisting at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. All right? Do you see that this is an entirely new law? It has nothing in common with God's law. Nothing in common. God's law, you had to rest. You had to rest in God, with God, on the seventh day because he's the one who created you, and therefore he has a claim to you. He wants to spend quality time with you. He wants you to rest, and he wants everything else to rest around you as well. And he was your creator, that's why I told you. Here, you are commanded to do certain official duties at a sacrificial offering. It's not in the Bible, so it's a totally new law. It's not God's law. It's the church's law. All right. Fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the, earth, the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The, it's their fourth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. And what's gone again is the promise. Again, for the same reason. Here's a new lawgiver. The old lawgiver in a new law has no jurisdiction to reward or otherwise if you're contrary to the law. 
Now the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, stays the same, except they stay one behind. And the eighth one, thou shalt not steal. The ninth one, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And then the tenth commandment in the, in the Bible says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, anything that is your neighbor's. Now in order to get ten, they divide this tenth commandment into two, although Romans specifically calls it one commandment, the covet commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. But there are certain things which are missing even in spite of that. For example, the wife is still there, there you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, but the house is not there. Can you see that? The maidservant is not there, the manservant is not there, the ox is not there, and the ass is not there. All right, now let's put that into modern language. The house can stay that way, but what is the manservant and the maidservant? That's the people in your employ. They are no longer in this commandment. And the other thing that's not there is the ox. What was the ox? That was the implement with which you worked the land. In other words, the tools of your trade. And what was the ass? That was your vehicle. That was your transport. So that's also not there. All right? So according to the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. According to that commandment, your neighbor had a house. And who did that house belong to? According to the commandment. To the neighbor, because you weren't allowed to cover it. And you were not to covet thy neighbor's wife, nor thy neighbor's manservant, worker, or maidservant, or his implements, or his vehicles. So here, you had some possessions. Here, it's pretty vague. We'll see what it, where it leads to. Now, let's go a little bit into history. This is the French Revolution. And the great philosophers behind the French Revolution, Voltaire, for example, and Robespierre, and all of these people, they were Jesuits. Interesting. And this is what came out of the French Revolution. This is the original Declaration of Human Rights that came out of the French Revolution. Now, if you look at it, what does it look like to you? This is how they presented it. It looks like a law, as if it was given in Scripture. But in actual fact, this is the Declaration of Human Rights. Now, if you look a little bit closer at it, you'll see there is the Declaration as it was given originally. And in the middle is a bundle of rods tied together and a staff or a spear through it. And on top, there's a little hat that looks like that. And above that is the serpent with a tail in its mouth. Fascinating. Now, a bundle of rods tied together with a spear or a sword in the middle is called a fasciae. And a fasciae comes from the Roman system where the Roman leader would have this bundle of rods tied to a staff and the rods suggested or implied the people and the, the government's organizations and the various tribes that were in unity tied to him in one unit and paid obeyance to him and obeyed him. Now, above it, they have the little Phrygian hat, which was the hat of the French Revolution. And above that, the serpent with the tail in its mouth, which is actually the eternal serpent, the one, the life-giving serpent. It's 
it's in a in a, an occult sense a symbol of Lucifer. Now this law is very fascinating, and the hat is very fascinating, and the fasciae are very fascinating. Now here is another statue which we find in the British Museum where this individual is wearing precisely that kind of hat. Now who was this? This was the god Mitra. Mitraism. Mitra, Mitra was the Persian sun god. And the entire system of Catholicism is a Mitraic. It's built up on the same level of organization as you had in Mitraism. So it has a religious connotation, but it's not God. It's the sun god that is being deified here. Now what about fascism? This is John Robbins. He's, a, he's an economist. He writes, under fascism, property rights or property owners may keep their property, titles and deeds, but the use of the property, as Pope Leo wrote, is common. Fascism is a form of socialism that retains the forms and trappings of capitalism, but not its substance. Under fascism, property titles and deeds are intact, but the institution of private property has disappeared. Government regulations and mandates have replaced it. For this distinction between legal ownership and actual use, the fascists owe a debt to the Roman church state. Interesting quote. The Jesuits claim that fascism is their preferred system of government. Now, when you think about fascism, you always think about militants and you think about uh, the Nazi regime and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But that's not the definition of fascism. Those are the trappings that come with fascism. Fascism actually has a very... Simple definition. The definition of fascism is government and industry in partnership for community. That's fascism. Government and industry in partnership for community. That's fascism. Now if you take the extremes on either side, then you would have Communism on the one side, where government owns everything. There's no partnership with anyone. Government is numero uno. Or you have capitalism on the other side. In capitalism, industry is independent of government. Government is associated with the governance and keeping people safe and rules and regulation and defending the constitution. And everybody does their thing independent of interference from government. So there is no partnership there. But when government and industry go into partnership for the community's sake, then you have fascism. Now, did the world have a financial meltdown, meltdown some years ago? Yes or no? Okay. And in order to save industry from total collapse, what happened? Government bailout. Here's the next question. Was the government bailout a loan or was it a buy-in? It wasn't a loan. It was a buy-in. In other words, government and industry, the banking elite, the industrial complexes, the motor industries... Everything, therefore, went into partnership for the sake of whom, apparently? For the community that it shouldn't experience total collapse. So, since the 90s, what have we got in the world? We have a form of fascism which is ruling the world. Now, in the French Revolution, reason was elevated to the status of goddess, and they actually dressed a woman and they called her the goddess of reason. And they had the solar blaze behind her. And they took her to the cathedral and they bowed down to her in mock uh, worship and they worshipped her. So it was a system that was set up that was contrary 
to what had been before. Now what happened in the French Revolution eventually became universal and in nine, between 1948 and 1998 there was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and human rights was to become the norm of every single nation under the sun. And if a nation decided to fight against it, then that nation didn't have a right to exist. You either capitulated and subjected yourself to these human rights, or you had no more place under the sun. Now in 2008, Pope Benedict was the speaker at the United Nations, and they prepared the way for him. The red carpet was laid out. They don't even do that for any other statesman. But for him it was done. And there he was, and he was giving his speech at the United Nations. There's Ban Ki-moon bringing him in. And he greets the crowds. And then he made his speech. And most people think his speech was pretty benign. But in actual fact, it was anything but benign. It was loaded. But we have to understand the language. Let's look at the language. Now here are the various newspapers reporting on the issue. And he said, quote, Respect for human rights was the key to solving many of the world's problems. He didn't talk about the law of God. He spoke about human rights. And then he said, human rights needs multilateral consensus. In other words, it must be universally accepted. Can't be just... You know, in isolation. And then he said something else that's fascinating. Warning that unless those human rights are considered God-given, they will be subject to erosion or revocation. Now, that is phenomenal. Who then is the one who gave human rights according to the Pope? God. They're God-given. They must be considered as God-given. Now, Paul spoke about someone who sits in the temple of God pretending to be God. So I would just like to ask him, which God are you referring to? Are you referring to the God of the Bible? Or are you referring to the one who sits in the temple of God pretending to be God? All right, fascinating. He waxes about you know, human rights, etc. And then they say, he said, they are based on natural law, inscribed on human hearts and present in different cultures and civilizations. Now, Pope's will stands for reason. Why would the law of God have to be changed? Why would the second hand commandment be removed, etc., etc.? What, what did we say? So that it would be multicultural. So that you would have a generic God that you wouldn't have the specific deity that most people have a problem with. All right? And it's based on natural law. What does he mean? Human rights, the Pope said, are the key to world peace and security. So human rights are pretty important. And by the way, if you switch on your television, what do you hear? Law of God, law of God, law of God, or do you hear human rights, human rights, human rights? Obviously you hear human rights. Now, let's ask the encyclopedias of the world, and this is a simple one, but it says the same as the others. Greek philosophy emphasized the distinction between nature on the one hand and law, custom, and convention on the other, and what the law commanded varied from place to place, but what was by nature should be the same everywhere. So this is natural law. Let's go further. This is the Chronicle of Higher Education, and this is Professor Alan Wolf, who happened to be a Jewish professor. He died recently. And he says, among Catholic intellectuals, as well as some that are not Catholic, the most important Catholic inheritance is the natural law tradition. So when the Pope says that human rights are based on natural law, he's talking about their tradition, Roman Catholic tradition. This is a Roman Catholic precept. Now, what does it mean? So let's go to the Jesuit professors of the Roman Catholic Church and let's ask them, 
Here is the professor of moral theology at St. Patrick's Seminary in California. He's a Jesuit. And his name is Richard Gula. And Richard Gula writes, natural law is central to Roman Catholic theology. The advantage of using natural law is that the church shows great respect for human goodness and trusts the human capacity to know and choose what is right. And then he waxes on and on and on, eventually in his, in his work, that the one who should actually make the choices as to what is right and what is wrong in a moral sense would be the shepherd of the flock. And who would that be? That would be Rome. And I'll show you some of those quotes later as we go on in the lecture. But here is the problem. You see, Roman Catholic natural law is derived from the premise that the reason is unfallen. And that's why he can make moral choices and inflict them upon the entire world. Whereas Protestant law of nature embodies reason subdued by the word. So we have two ideologies in this world. Isaiah says, Why should you be stricken? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And Romans says, and this, so this is Old and New Testament, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I am a fallen human being. And Rome says, no, my reason is unfallen. And therefore, my human goodness can be employed to make moral decisions. Martin Luther said, human reason is blind, deaf, senseless, godless, and sacrilegious in all its dealings with God's word and works. So Protestantism said, my morality has to be injected by a higher morality. It has to come from God. And the standard for my morality must be the word of God. Roman Catholicism says no. By tradition and natural law, by my reason, I will determine which morality is suitable for this planet, irrespective of the word of God. So we have two ideologies. John 15 verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, he shall bring forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. But the Pope says, no, without Jesus, I can determine what's right and wrong and inflict it upon the world. Impose it. So if reason is unfallen, then we should be able to save ourselves by our reason. Moreover, natural law also requires something else. In Catholic thinking, it requires the sacrifice of individualism to collectivism. Because if you want to be individualistic in a society, you might want to go contrary to the norms of that society, and then you would be a cancer in that society. So the best thing to do is to subject yourself to the norms of the society, whether you agree with them or not. This gets interesting. And the Jesuit, Murray, writes, Natural law regards the community as given equal with the person. Man is regarded as a member of an order given by God and subject to the order that makes the order an order. This is typical Jesuit writing. But what it basically says is, you will not stick your head above the norm. You hold your place. So there's therefore not just right or wrong, but what is right and wrong must be determined then by Rome. Now here's the address of Benedict when he spoke to the Congregation of Doctrine and Faith. This is the organization that sets down the law for the Roman Catholic Church. He says, Informing the consciences of the faith, the faithful must pay careful attention to the sacred and certain teachings of the church, not the word of God. 
For the Catholic Church is by the will of Christ the teacher of truth. It is her duty to proclaim and teach with authority the truth which is Christ and at the same time to declare and confirm by, what does it say there? Her authority. The principles of the moral order which spring from human nature itself. So who will determine right or wrong according to Pope Benedict? The church will. Not God, not the Bible. They will. This is Benedict speaking to the students at the University of Rome. And he says, The Pope is first of all the Bishop of Rome, and as such, in virtue of the apostolic succession from the Apostle Peter, he has episcopal authority in regard to the entire Catholic Church. The word bishop or episkopos means supervision. He's the supervisor. He says he's also the shepherd. And because he's the shepherd and the supervisor, he has an, what's he call it? An elevated point of observation. Interesting. He surveys the whole landscape, making sure to keep the flock together, etc., etc. And then he talks about the community. But the community that the bishop cares for, as large or small as it may be, lives in the world. Its conditions, its journey, its example, the words inevitably influence the rest of the human community in its entirety. Thus, the Pope, as the shepherd of his community, has increasingly become a voice of ethical reasoning of humanity. So who's going to decide ethics for humanity? The Pope will. Now Luther said no. Luther said, Schriftprinzip. Bible, the Word, that's the principle. And he said, Rome has Führerprinzip, leadership principle. So for a Protestantism, the Word is the standard, but for Catholicism, the Pope is the standard. So now, we're, we're coming to an impasse. What if the two are diametrically opposed to each other? Then your head will be doing this. Excuse me, what am I going to believe? Who am I going to follow? Martin Luther wrote, We should learn to separate spiritual and temporal power from each other as far as heaven and earth, for the Pope has greatly obscured this matter and has mixed the two powers. He was a very observant man, Martin Luther. Now, let's jump a little bit closer to our time. Jacobinism. This was the New America, March 7, 2005, and George Bush was spreading his power across the entire globe at that stage. It was a very military time in the history of the United States. And uh, Condoleezza Rice, as Secretary of State, made a fascinating speech in which she said, in Paris, interesting that she did it in Paris, she said, that the Bush's administration's global democratic revolution continues the work of the 18th century French Revolution. So what this imperial power was doing was spreading the ideology of the French Revolution to the whole world. That implies human rights, doesn't it? That's why we hear so much about human rights. Now, let's have a look at some more details. Here is the, the emblem of the Department of the Army of the United States of America. This is their emblem. And uh, there you have the cannonballs and the military might and the power. But here you have a spear. And what is that? Excuse me, what is that? It's the Phrygian hat of the French Revolution. And uh, a little closer observation. Excuse me, what is that? It's the serpent. This will defend. Is there any difference between the ideology of the French Revolution and the ideology of the United States in implementing and enforcing it upon the entire world? Yes or no? Not according to the speech of Condoleezza Rice and not according to their emblem. It's exactly the same. 
What the papacy has realized is that by constantly enlarging the rights of man, to use the Vatican's own phrase, it can offer ever new moral arguments for enlarging the size, scope, and power of government. Gaudium et spes, that's one of the papal encyclicals by Pope Paul VI, one of the major documents issued by the Second Vatican Council is typical of many pronouncement of church state in favor of such governmental interference in the economy. And then follows a long list of human rights which all come out of the papal pen. When you read them, they sound great. Let's read them, some of them. You have a right to found a union. You have a right to culture, to emigrate, to immigrate, to food, to clothing, to rest, to medical care, to wage, to a, a right to life. You have a right to a safe environment security of the workers, family life, private property, common use of all goods, right to work, pension, old age, insurance, association, security, bodily integrity, the right to strike, to choose a state of life freely, to found a family, to education, to employment, to reputation, to respect, all of these wonderful things, protection of privacy, right for freedom, professional training, education, health care, Sounds great, right? Now, if you enforce each one of these, how big must government become? And how far must the tentacles of government then reach? Well, basically into your bedroom. Probably into your bathroom. The Second Vatican Council, this is Guardium et Spes, this is the Pope speaking himself, this is Pope Paul VI encyclical, the complex circumstances of our day make it necessary for public authority to intervene more and more often in social, economic and cultural matters. They will tell you what to do. Already in 1874, Britain's Prime Minister Gladstone said, individual servitude, however abject, will not satisfy the Latin Church, the state must also be a slave. You must be subject to this morality because they will dictate it and because of their elevated position, you will subject to it. And as an individual, you will not rebel against it. You will pick up problems. Now, let's just run through human rights as we see them today in their implementation and God's law. Because remember, the Pope said, that human rights were God-given, right? And I'm sure that if we made a case for it, you would find in many human rights aspects that God would certainly approve of. That's not a problem. But what if mingled into these human rights were aspects which totally negate the law of God? Can the new law thus be a law given by the same God, yes or no? If God says he doesn't change, then obviously not. So let's just take the first commandment. I'm the Lord, the God, the one who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. That's a law. Now the humanist manifesto said, I'm convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive the role as proselytes of the new faith a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. That's pantheism. All right? Now, every human being, every religion, must, according to human rights, be valued on the same level. And so eventually, curriculums change. And... I was in academia at the university right in this time period when our own academia changed. And then Curriculum 2000 came in. Do you remember that? And school curricula changed. And universities had to adapt and change their curriculums. And I remember sitting in the office. This was at the University of the Western Cape. Across one of these old Dutch reform theologians, who had been teaching theology for donkey's years. And we had a little chat, and suddenly the man burst into tears. Here's this old man crying. 
And I said to him, what's wrong? And he said to you, do you know how things have changed? I now no longer have a department of theology. I have a department of religious studies. And I may not mention the name Jesus anymore. And I may not pray in his name because that would be offensive to the others. And uh, I could concur with the man. And then our school children were subjected to a new religious curriculum. And they had to be subjected to Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and learn all the prayers of all the different religions. And it was taught as a cultural hodgepodge where we must all recognize the beauty and the divinity in all of these organizations. And in a very special sense, we've just had a dramatic experience in France where this came very much to the fore. We must learn to live together and respect each other in all of these issues. I have no problem with respect. I have no problem with freedom of choice. But when a child has to, by law, be taught that all religious systems are equal and that they're basically serving the same God in a different way, what happens to God's first command? You shall have no other gods beside me. Which me? The God that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Now Allah doesn't have a son. Allah has no son. He's all by himself and there was no atonement. Now excuse me, are the two deities then the same or are they not the same? So doesn't human rights negate God's law and make it null and void? Yes or no? So the first commandment by human rights is God. What about this statement? The new equality laws substantially restrict religious liberty. Professor Ian Lee of Durham University, a human, human rights, uh, leading human rights lawyer, said today that government regulations have the potential to seriously undermine freedom of association for religious people. They place the modern concept of equality over and above religious liberty. So they realize this. They realize this. Now the second commandment says, you shall not make an image, you shall not bow down to it. And Rome removed that commandment as offensive. In fact, it has its own version which you can find in Article 1160 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was the one from the Seventh Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, and it reads as following. Following the divinely inspired teaching of our Holy Fathers and the tradition of the Catholic Church, note, there's no Bible there, I put that there in writing myself, in red. We rightly define with full certainty and correctness that like the figures of the precious and life-giving figure of the cross, venerable and holy images of our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ, our inviolate lady, the holy mother of God, the venerated angels, the saints of the just, whether painted or made of mosaics or another suitable material, are to be exhibited in the holy churches of God on sacred vessel, vestments, walls, panels, and houses, and on streets." Isn't that the exact opposite of what the second commandment said? Yes or no? Yes, that's pretty straightforward. We're not interested in your commandment. We'll make an opposite commandment. All right. Today, it has just been established or been said after this big furor and previously in the United States, in the United Nations, that there should be a law against the criticism of religion. And the, this is talk all over the world today. And in fact, it can be considered offensive or hate speech to say anything against any other religion. So basically, if you're saying that bowing down to idols or to statues is contrary to the will of God, you are saying something that's offensive. So human rights would prevent you from doing that. Aren't you negating the second commandment then? Absolutely. 
Now the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your, in God in vain. And what is blasphemy in the Bible, by the way? In John chapter 10, verse 33, the Jews were angry with Jesus and they said, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. So here's a definition of blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thou self God. And the second time they tried to stone him and they said he speaks blasphemy is when he forgave someone's sins because who can forgive sins but God alone? Two statements of blasphemy. If you say you're God and if you say you can forgive sins. Now what does Rome say? Rome says the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man but as it were God and the vicar of God. Interesting. So doesn't he make himself God? And then this statement, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. Fascinating. So the priest is more important than God. And they say he becomes an alter Christos, another God, another Christ. So Rome has these blasphemous statements and today... Forbidden to pray in the name of Jesus in the military of the United States. You're not allowed to pray in the name of Jesus anymore in assemblies, in openings of parliaments, public organizations, public assemblies. Then you have to be generic. Doesn't that negate God's commandment? And then Rome issued a fascinating statement which says, if you criticize Rome and the papacy, it's an act of terrorism. Interesting. Interesting. Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Six days shall you labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. What about that commandment? Which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That's the converts' catechism of Catholic doctrine. So Rome says it changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Interesting. Melanchthon, writing on Daniel 7.25, this is Old English, so don't think the spelling is wrong. He, referring to the papacy, changes times and laws that any of the six working days commanded of God, he will make them unholy and idle days when he lists, when he wants to. Or of their own holy days abolish and make work days again and when they change ye Saturday to Sunday. They have changed God's laws and turned them into their own traditions to be kept above God's precepts. So the reformers already realized this but they were so involved in other issues they didn't even act upon it. And when finally there was a breakaway and the Anabaptists and later the Baptists did start introducing the seventh day again, then most of them didn't have the courage to go along with it. So the Roman Catholic Church says Sunday is the mark of our authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So Rome is pretty adamant about it and claims that the Catholic Church changed the law and it is a mark of her ecclesiastical power so that they changed the Sabbath. And this here is the Cardinal of the Catholic Church answering a, a question and he says, if Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day and keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. Protestantism in discarding the authority of the Roman Church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday holy as the Sabbath. I like this one, this Roman Catholic Church uh, statement says, it's not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. Uh, interesting fellows. And this one comes from the Catholic Mirror, which, was an, which is the official paper of uh, Rome in America. And it says, 
Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one of the other of these alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday, compromise is impossible. In fact, at the Council of Trent, when this was debated, and uh, whether the Bible should be the norm or tradition should also be part of the norm, the Protestant argument for the Bible was so overwhelming that many of the Catholic bishops were shaken. And then the Archbishop of Reggio walked into the amphitheater and he held a speech. And he said, you Protestants say the Bible and the Bible alone. Why do you keep Sunday? You're keeping a commandment of the Roman Catholic Church. Why do you keep Sunday? So you're keeping tradition. So you're not sola scriptura because you are obeying our commandment. Therefore, you are nothing but a rebellion and you will disappear. That's what he said. Now, Pope John Paul was the one who launched a crusade to save Sunday and he said, Sunday must not be worked, but it must be celebrated as the Lord's Day. And he went further. He said, a person who violates the sanctity of Sunday is to be punished as a heretic. So they're pretty adamant about their law and enforcing their law. Now why? Because it is their authority that's at stake. If you obey them, you acknowledge their authority. If you obey God, you acknowledge the authority of God. So here we have a choice. And Pope Benedict was next in line and he also said we can't live without Sunday. And Pope Francis has just recently again reiterated the fact that we must all keep Sunday. And uh, this was Rome's challenge on the ImmaculateHeart.com uh, webpage. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday, and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is dishonest and a denial of Catholic, what? Authority. So the issue is not the day, the issue is the authority. If Protestants want to base their teachings on the Bible, they should worship on Saturday. Now in Romans 3 it says, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So let's make it quite clear. Nobody's saved by keeping the law. You are saved by grace. But the law tells you what's right and wrong. In the eyes of whom? God. Now if the Pope has a different law, then he will tell you what's right and wrong in the eyes of who? The Pope. So it's a question of whose authority do I accept? It's not a question now just of a day. It's a much bigger problem. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Just because we are saved by grace and we live by faith doesn't mean that God's law has been negated. We walk by faith and we keep God's law by faith irrespective of the consequences. That's why the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. The law doesn't save you, but the law is not bad. It condemns you to death, yes, but the solution to that is Christ who paid the price for you. So if you think that the law is gone in the New Testament times, you're in big problems because the entire law can be found in New Testament language. So it's there in the New and the Old Testament. And what did the Reformers say? Spurgeon said, Jesus didn't come to change the law, he came to explain it. And the very fact shows that it remains. There's no abrogation of the law. It's not gone. Then why do so many theologians say the law is gone? Wesley says, I cannot spare the law one moment. No more than I can spare Christ. Each is continually sending me to the other. The law to Christ, Christ to the law. The height and the depth of the law constrain me to fly to the love of God in Christ and the love of God in Christ endears the law to me above gold and precious stones. The beautiful way of, of explaining it. So I'm a transgressor. If I look at the Ten Commandments as in a mirror, I see, oops, <laughs> I've got a problem. 
So it sends me to Christ. Christ forgives me and sends me back to the law. Go and sin no more. Don't transgress God's law anymore. So that's the way of salvation. If you look at the character of God in the Bible, then all these texts still say that God is just, true, pure, light, faithful, good, spiritual, holy, truth, life, righteousness, perfect, and forever. And then when it talks about the law, you say the law is just, the law is true, pure, light, faithful, good, spiritual, holy, truth, life, righteousness, perfect, and forever. Excuse me. If you get rid of the law, you get rid of the character of God. You can't do it. So the law stands. What about the fifth commandment? Honor thy father and thy mother for thy days, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. This is the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. It's a legal organization which helps people overseas who want to homeschool their children because they don't want them to be associated with the new curricula that are being taught there. We should start with the question, why did the founders neglect to include parental rights in the text of the Constitution? Why? Because no one could ever envision a form of government that pitted fit parents against the state over the rights to make decisions concerning their children. Now today, you have human rights. And you have a special category of human rights, which is called child right. Now which stands higher? The right of the child or the right of the parent in human rights? Child right is higher. Child right is higher. So that if you make decisions for your child which the government deems unfit, may the government interfere in your personal lives and if necessary remove your children from you and put them under foster care under government supervision. Yes or no? Yes. All right? So the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. But human rights says, honor your child. In Germany, if the parent tells the child, it's your turn to wash the dishes, you will wash the dishes, the child can take the parent to court for contravening its human rights. It's a serious issue. And this here, is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. If this treaty becomes binding, the government would have the power to intervene in a child's life for the best interests of the child. The American Bar Association, which supports the treaty, has already opined that teaching children that Jesus is the only way to God violates the spirit and the meaning of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, in other words, if you say that there is only one way for salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ, and the new curriculum says you must treat all religions as equal, then you are in violation of human rights. So, is the fifth commandment gone on the basis of human rights, yes or no? Yes. The sixth commandment says thou shalt not kill. Family crisis at the United Nations. The Family Research Council recently published a collection of essays entitled 50 Years After the Declaration. And they say there's a problem. Why? Because of the social policies of the United Nations as they relate to women, abortion and children's rights. It has become a tool to advance abortion, homosexuality, euthanasia and other destructive causes. So, today... If you want an abortion, can you get one? Even if you're a minor? Yes. Do you have to have your parents' permission? No. Because that would violate the right of the child. So the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. But human rights says, you have not only the right, but the duty to kill. If the doctor in a government institution refuses an abortion, what happens to him? He's in serious trouble. He's in serious trouble because the law says you better kill. You better kill. 
Matthew 1.23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. It doesn't say with fetus. It says with child. And when Elizabeth and Mary came together, what happened to the child in Elizabeth's womb? It jumped. And it was called a child. Now let's go to the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now the law of adultery, if you read your Bible and you see all the subdivisions, is not only dealing with husband and wife in a marital state, but it deals with a whole host of moral issues about sleeping with this one or that one or relations between different sexes, same sexes, uh, even with animals. All of those issues are mentioned in the Bible falling under the category of this law. Now, SIECUS is the Sexual Information and Education Council in the United States, and every country has the same thing. We have these councils in South Africa, and in fact, if you want to know, when you're driving along our roads and you see these huge billboards about AIDS, that's these organizations that put them up. Parental involvement. While it is generally desirable for parents to be involved in their children's contraceptive decisions, the right of each person to confidentiality and privacy in receiving contraceptive information, counseling and services is paramount. Gay marriages around the world. South Africa was one of the first countries in the world to ratify uh, these issues. So this is fascinating. Since the Netherlands became the first country to allow same-sex marriage 12 years ago, many countries have followed. France is the latest to support this, etc., etc. Here is same-sex marriages and which countries have allowed it, etc. Argentina, Belgium, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, Denmark, etc. One of the, the first, of course, was South Africa itself. Now, hate crime. In the United States, if you say anything against this, then you can be in serious trouble. For example, if you say something against the gay pride rally, you can receive 47 years in prison or and $90,000 fine. That in today's reckoning is 1 million rand that you will be fined and 47 years in prison. But if you blow somebody's head off, you'll probably get five months suspended for the next 5,000 years. In Canada, if you quote the Bible verses, even on a foreign web page, five years imprisonment. Five years imprisonment. This is fascinating. Circa's position it is the position of Sisekis that the use of explicit sexual material, sometimes referred to as pornography, can serve a variety of important needs in the lives of countless individuals. Now, in the past, pornography was forbidden in this country. Today, it is explicit. You drive down this road, you probably see adult world 5,000 times before you see something reasonable. Abortion. Every woman, regardless of age or income, should have the right to obtain an abortion at a reasonable cost. Adults should have the right to access sexually explicit material for personal rule, rule, use. Legislative and judicial efforts to prevent the production or distribution of sexually explicit material endanger constitutionally guaranteed freedoms of speech and press. Let's go to our country. Top TV has right to broadcast porn. This is directly from the SABC webpage that has to issue the licenses. The Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, ICASA, has heard that it is no choice but to that it has no choice but to allow Top TV three porn channels. It was reported today. It has no choice. Why doesn't it have a choice? Because it's your human right to have access to pornography. Now, I'm not arguing here the pros and cons. I'm just asking a simple question. 
I'm not talking for or against gay. I'm not doing any of that tonight. I'm just asking one simple question. Do the new laws lift up the standard in God's law or do they negate them? So do human rights negate God's law, yes or no? Every single one of them is gone by now. Surely they won't tell you that you can steal. Because the law says thou shalt not steal, and you shall not bear false witness, and you shalt not covet your neighbor's house, his wife, his workers, his implements, or his vehicles. And the ninth commandment, you shalt not bear false witness, the Bible says, none calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and they speak lies, they conceive mischief and they bring forth iniquity and they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongues to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity, said Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah is a type of the final message that has to go to the world. He says, For I have not sent them, says the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out and that you may perish ye, and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Question, why is evolution theory compulsory in schools and creation not? This was a question posed to the, to the BBC. And they wrote, with creationism banned and evolution compulsory in virtually all U.S. schools, many creationists have opted to withdraw their children from the state schools. Most religious leaders continue to regard creationism as a superstition. Aren't they telling the students lies? Of course they are. And they're getting their lies legislated. Thou shalt not lie, they're getting their lies legislated. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. This is the encyclical, the most famous one, quoted by every single modern pope, including the present one. No, especially the present one. This is the encyclical Rerum Novarum. Every man has, by nature, natural law, the right to possess property of his own. It was issued by Pope Leo in 1810 to 1903 and has been incorporated in every encyclical of all the modern popes. Article 22. It is lawful, says Thomas Aquinas, for a man to hold private property and is also necessary for the carrying on of human existence. But if the question be asked, how must one's possession be used? The church replies without hesitation in the words of the same holy doctor, man should not consider his material possession as his own, but as common to all, so as to share them without hesitation when others are in need. So according to canon law, the control of all property of the Roman church state belongs to the Pope. And the Roman Catholic doctrine of private property is the same as the communist slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Now this is what Thomas Aquinas wrote. Because the goods of some are due to others by natural law, there is no sin if the poor take the goods of their neighbors. Thomas wrote, in cases of need, all things are common property so that there could be no sin in taking another's property for need has made it common. But the question is, who defines need? Me? I need a TV. And I need it right now. So I'm going to take yours. Because my need has made it common. Summa Theologica says it is lawful for man to succor his own need by means of another's property by taking it either openly or secretly. Nor is this, properly speaking, theft or robbery. It is not theft, properly speaking, to take secretly and use another's property in case of extreme need, because that which he takes for the support of his life becomes his own property by reason of that need. In case of a like need, a man may also take secretly another's property in order to succor his neighbor in need. Good. So I need a television, but I'm sure Joe also needs one. And I see this house has two or three I can take two because we 
need it. I can actually clean your house out, bring a truck, because there's so much need out there. Canon law 1254 says the Catholic Church has the innate right to acquire, retain, administer, and alienate temporal goods in pursuit of its proper ends independently of the civil power. That's pretty powerful. Who do you belong to? Who controls your life? John Paul said, it is necessary to state once more the characteristic principle of Christian social doctrine. The goods of this world are originally meant for all. The right of private property is valid, but doesn't nullify the principle that it is under a social mortgage. Do you own your house according to Catholicism, yes or no? If someone has need of it, can they take it? Have they done it in communism? Absolutely. They practice that in their reductions in South America, and it's a Jesuit theology. Communism. Fascism is a Jesuit theology. You have private property, you may maintain it, you may pay the rights, rates, but it's not yours. In times of need, people can make use of it. Can they come and live on it? It's called squatting. Can you do it? And you think it's a black-white issue? No, no, no. It's a universal issue. It's in every single country. And it happens black upon black, black upon white, white upon white, green upon green, irrespective of who or what you are. It's a social issue, not a race issue. It's a law. All goods includes, this is John Paul II. He's now a saint. Pope Francis declared him a saint. You can pray to him. Not just good found in nature, but manufactures good as well. So your car, everything that belongs to you. If one is in extreme need, Gaudium Express, these are the modern poets speaking, you have the right to procure yourself what you need from others. So the law of God, does it still stand in Catholicism? Or has it been negated by human rights, yes or no? Of course it's negated. Irrespective of all the good things that you will find in it, that you might cling to, there is a new deity in charge. And it's not the God of the Bible. So how do I respond? And how do I say, I worship God, the one who is described in the Bible who is the I am who took the children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them into Canaan as a type of salt saving mankind and taking them out of the world and bringing them to a heavenly Canaan. How do I acknowledge that I accept his authority in my life? By keeping his law. And if I keep his law, will I get into trouble? Absolutely. Absolutely on every turn. Now let's see how this works. The Bible says that he will control how much of the world? What will the little horn eventually control? The whole earth. And you say to yourself, now forget it. How can one little pope who only serves one portion of mankind, Christianity, and then only a portion of that, how can he control the world? Forget it. And I've heard this argument over and over again. And if you don't understand the mechanizations and the workings of the inner circles of society, you will never understand this. So let's see how it works. How this organization can control the entire world. And I'm going to use South Africa as an example, but it's universal. It's a principle. And this is not speaking against individuals, because... People don't necessarily know, just like mankind out there doesn't know. How many people in South Africa march and are on fire for human rights? Virtually all. Virtually all. But if they understood all the principles, would they perhaps be less enthusiastic? So it's a question of knowledge. So I'm not judging, but I'm going to reveal. Here is the previous pope. And there is the previous head of the Knights of Malta. 
That was Prince Andrew Willoughby Ninian Bertie. Always has to be a royal. And he's the head of the Knights of Malta. Now he's deceased and there's another one in his place. But just for the sake of the picture, here he is kissing the ring of the Pope. Who are the Knights of Malta subject to? They're subject to the Pope. That's their first allegiance. So when he died in 2008, here's the new Grand Master. His Most Eminent Highness, Matthew Festing. So he's also a royal. And there he is, kissing the ring of the Pope and bowing down. Who's he subject to? The Pope. And anyone who becomes a Knight of Malta is absolutely under his command and therefore also absolutely under the control and command of the Roman Catholic Church state. It's just a fact. It's how it is. It's how it works. Now, here's an organization which is the Knights of Malta, also known as the Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem, and this comes straight from their webpage. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia, this is the Catholic source, and it'll tell us that the most important of all the... Excuse me, what does it say there? Military. I thought the Pope didn't have an army. Or does he have an army? And if he has an army, who is his army? Everybody out there who has an army, who is subject to the Pope, is actually lending his army for the services of whom? The Pope. Now let's see how this works. It's the most important of the military orders, both for the extent of its area and for its duration. It is said to have existed, though they always have to be euphemistic, before the Crusades and is not extinct at the present time. Now, this is what a knight of Malta looked like. And uh, they were the guardians of Jerusalem in the old days. And they wore this cross, the Maltese cross, on their shoulder. This was their emblem. So if we want to look at a prominent modern knight of Malta, then there you have one. It's the queen. She's not only a Knight of Malta, she's also a Bilderberger. And so she's head of the shadow world government. And uh, many kings and many highly placed or, uh, personages are in these organizations. Now, it's not a black-white issue, as you can see, because the queen, as you will all know, is Lily White. Now here is Bonnie Prince Charles, and uh, what is he wearing around his neck there? The Maltese cross. Now he's also the Grand Master of another order, which is called the Order of the Bath, and we'll come to it later. And these people are all Knights of Malta. Now they say there's a Protestant organization, Knights of Malta, and a Catholic order, Knights of Malta, which of course is impossible, because if you're a Knight of Malta, you're subject to the Pope. And if you wear the same regalia and you do exactly the same things, if you look like a duck and you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck, you're a duck. So they're all Roman Catholic organizations, whether they call themselves Pro Protestant, Hindu, or Islam. Now, here you have Prince Albert bowing down to the Pope. Now this is a very fortunate man in the world because he married a South African girl, thus vastly improving the gene pool of his country. <laughs> and uh, there he is bowing down to the Pope and the Pope made Albert a knight of the order of Malta and there he is wearing his Maltese cross. Now when he married his nice Protestant Dutch Reform South African little girl what did she have to do? She had to convert to Catholicism. I would like to have a little talk with her one day in private. <laughs> but maybe you can send her the DVD. Now here's the previous king, Juan Carlos, bowing down to the Pope. Also a uh, Knight of Malta, 
Now the Jesuits is an, are another order, and the Jesuits are ruled by a general, so it's also a military order, and has become, in a special sense, the controlling order behind all other orders. So they all work together. Now, let's go to the South African context and link it to the world context. There you have a previous president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, and a present president of Zimbabwe, and they are obviously good friends, right? In fact, this one over here has special powers because he just never disappears from the scene. And he's now currently, again, serving, in spite of his, his position in the world, as the head of the African Union. So he's the chief man. Now, why would this be? And no matter how much bad press he gets, he remains the president. And I was particularly fascinated at the inauguration of Prince of Pope Francis, where this man, who doesn't have an international visa and is not allowed to travel anywhere, was a welcome guest at the inauguration, and is the only one where the Pope actually bowed to him and gave his wife a fascinating handshake. And then it's even more fascinating to me that this very wife who received the fascinating handshake is now being built up to be the next leader and the one that was supposed to be is being demonized and removed from the scene so that she can take over the next position. Who are these people and why are they in power and why do they stay in the upper echelons of power even in the entire African continent? That includes Islamic countries as well, doesn't it? Okay. And of course, Iranians, etc., etc., the so-called demonized ones. Now let's run through the presidents of the new South Africa. The first president was Thabo Mbeki. What was, ah, Thabo, was Nelson Mandela. What is he wearing? The regalia of a knight of Malta. So, who is his first allegiance to? To the Pope. To the Pope. Here he is receiving the host from the Catholic bishop in Cape Town. Now canon law of the Roman Catholic Church says you cannot receive the host unless you are a Roman Catholic. Now he never ever told anyone what his religious affiliation was Least of all did he say that he was in the Roman Catholic camp. But be that as it may, if he was a knight of Malta and he had the power to implement laws, whose laws would he implement? Roman Catholic laws. And who would be the people chosen to be his underlings and sit in the committees? Those who have the same mindset. So if you go and you look at the presidents of the world and you look at who their speech writers are, you will nine out of ten times find that they are actually Jesuits or Knights of Malta writing the speeches. Now the next president was Thabo Mbeki. Look at his regalia. What is he? He's a Knight of Malta. So what policies would he further? The same ones as his predecessor. Exactly the same. So if you're wondering why some laws have changed drastically and people believe or think that it might be a black-white issue, I have news for you. It's not a black-white issue. Do only white South African farmers lose their farms or what happens in Zimbabwe or in other African countries? There's a huge shift of land which is not race-bound, but which is ideology-bound. And therefore, we should have a lot of sympathy for each other. Now, let's look at the next one. Who was he? Or is he? President Zuma. Now, here he is with the Queen, who is a Knight of Malta. And she did the following. 
The country has achieved the mammoth task of transforming it, and the Queen made Mr. Zuma an honorary knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath. Now, the head of the Order of the Bath is Prince Charles. Now, the Order of the Bath is a military order. It's purely military. So only those people who have succeeded in great military exploits on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church receive this honor. So Ronald Reagan, for example, received the honor of becoming a member of the Order of the Bath. Now what military success did he succeed in? He's the one who brought diplomatic relations between the United States and the Vatican contrary to the American Constitution. And so for this great feat, he was given the order of the bath. So it's a military order. Now, who was he head of before he became president? In Contwe with Siswe. And what was that? That was the military arm of South Africa. So it's appropriate that he wasn't made uh, an order of the, of the Malta, but order of the Bath. Now some say that's a bit of a joke, and because of his history, it might have been more appropriate to make him the order of the shower. <laughs> but that's not the point. So top honors, President Jacob Zuma has joined an illustrious group of heads of state across the world and throughout history, becoming honorary Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath. Now let's have a look at uh, Mugabe. This is the Council of Foreign Relations. You don't get higher sources than that in the world. And they claim Mugabe was trained by Jesuits. And it is a well-known fact that he is in that uh, organization. So when you look at the Knights of Malta, you're not only looking at these grand uh, people dressed in these wonderful regalia and thinking these are all royals hobnobbing with each other. No, you have to go further. The CIA... Who formed the CIA? The CIA was formed by the Catholic Knight of Malta, William Wilde Bill Donovan. And he was considered the father of the CIA. So the CIA is a Knight of Malta established organization. The FBI, who established that. The Catholic University of America, Charles Joseph Bonaparte. What was he? Knight of Malta. So... The mightiest secret organizations in the world, secret services, CIA, FBI, subject to Knight of Malta. Now let's run through them. The dangerous rebranding of John Brannan. This is Al Jazeera. How does this happen? How can a constitutional law professor and community activist, President Obama, and a Jesuit-trained intelligent analyst with an interest in just war theory be the new director of the CIA. So who runs the CIA today? The Jesuits or the Knights of Malta. It doesn't matter who runs it. And who runs the other secret services in the world? South Africa's secret service is trained by whom? Officially by the CIA. Do you think they all are in cahoots in this area? Where's the greatest secret service in the entire world? I can show you the video, but I haven't got it in this lecture. It's in the Vatican. And every other secret society and secret organization, military or otherwise, is subject to that. All right, let's go higher up. Leon Panetta, former director of the CIA. What is he now? He's Secretary of the Defense, so he's the highest man who makes the military decisions together with the top people. Where was he trained? Santa Clara University. What is he? He's Jesuit trained. Who really controls this planet? Opus Dei. Opus Dei, the way, a collection of 999 religious maxims. 999, turn that upside down, what you get? 
666. And the most important one is that true Christians must be disciplined and obedient to a spiritual director. You may not decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong. Their Kingdom Come is a fascinating book about Opus Dei. It's just another organization. So you have the Knights of Malta running the militaries of the world. By the way, when the United States Army goes to war, it is the head of the Knights of Malta in the United States, who currently is Cardinal Egan, who accompanies them on the warship and blesses them and sends them on a crusade. Fascinating. Read the history between the lines. An explosive espousé of one of the most powerful and secret sects operating within the Roman Catholic Church. In this book, he gives the evidence that they control many of the banking cartels. By the way, the Bank of America belongs to the Jesuits directly. Directly. They own it. And if you want to know who runs the financial systems of the world, it's the Jesuits through its agents that run it. So is Catholicism actually controlling the world? And by owning all the banks and transferring the money, which is called laundering, you can finance anything from terrorist organizations to drug cartels to you name it. Where the money is, where the power is, these people are in control. Trilateral Commission. By the way, their emblem is also a 666. There is the entire Trilateral Commission. These are the top people who rule the world. Who's standing in the midst as the most honest guest? The Pope. And uh, Mario Monti is the chair in Europe. And when Italy went into crisis, who did they put in control without a vote? Mario Monti. No problem. And when Greece was in control, who did they put in charge? A Knight of Malta. They are in control, whether you are in Asia or whether you are in Americas, or whether you are in Europe, there are powerful organizations that run not only the military, not only the secret societies and the secret organizations, they run the schools. The schooling systems of the world were founded by Jesuits. The theaters of the world were founded by Jesuits. Rome claims that it is its birthright to control the press, the television, and the entertainment world. It is its birthright. And when you want to know who is indoctrinating you when you switch on CNN, which was started by another high secret society, 33 degree Freemason, Ted Turner, who was totally against Christianity, then you must know who runs this world behind the scenes. America's new president. Now, this, this magazine is America. This magazine, America, is the Jesuit magazine in the United States. So these are Jesuits writing. Now, listen to what this Jesuit writes about von Rompe, who's now just been replaced by another one of the same family. But one interesting thing about Mr. von Rompe is his Catholicism. This is a Jesuit writing about which he makes no bones. He was educated, drum roll, civil play, by Jesuits in Brussels. Who controls the world? Is it this individual and that individual? Or is there a power behind the scenes? The Bible says the little horn will control the entire world. Now if you want to go to the Bilderbergers, which is the shadow governments of the world, then... Uh, whether you're working on the left or whether you're working on the right, it makes no difference. Build a boat. Were Mitt Romney and Bill Gates there? Was he there? Yes, he was. But uh, who was also there? Hillary and Obama. So whether you are a Democrat or whether you are a Republican, you're going to be in the same organization. But the question is, who started the Bilderbergers? And for what purpose? So if you want to be the financial boss of the entire world, well, then you better be there. There she is, head of the financial systems of the entire world. 
59 years after Bilderberg, here they all are together. Look at that security fence that was put around just for that last meeting. And now let's go to their own, to the own web page of the Bilderbergers. This is www.bilderberg.org, their own web page. And they're talking about their first uh, secretary, which was Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. And they say, you know, they met in this small place and they have the authorized autobiography of Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. And then this fascinating statement on their own web page. Because people like to think, you know, where you get this stuff from? Get it from them? They write, it was not Bernard's original idea, the Bilderbergers but had its inception in the brilliant brain of Dr. Joseph H. Rettinger. Rettinger was an extraordinary character who flitted through Europe talking on intimate terms with prime ministers, labor leaders, industrial magnates, revolutionaries, intellectuals, and all the non-communist rulers in Europe and etc. And then they say, he's what? What? He's Jesuitical convictions that the end justified the means. Though his name is virtually unknown except to the initiates, he made more history in his secret way than many a man who moved to the sound of the trumpet and the howl of the motorcycle sirens. According to the official publication of the European Central Culture, Center of Culture, Rettinger was the key figure in most of the great European U Union. The League of European Economic Cooperation, from which evolved the common market, the European movement, the European center of culture, would not have seen the light without him. The Congress of Europe at The Hague was this his doing. The Council of Europe grew out of it. Being above all a realist, he understood that even a united Europe could not stand by itself without America. Who rules the world? The Jesuits. The little horn power will control the whole world. The head of the Jesuits at one time said, it is not only Paris, but China that is under my control. And nobody knows how it is done. Fascinating. So here is Josef Heronim Rettinger, the Jesuit, who founded the Bilderbergers. And anybody who gets invited there had better be of that ideology. There was the former head of the Jesuits, Kolvenbach, the head of the Knights of Malta, the present head of the, of the Jesuits over here, Cardinal Egan, the head of the Knights of Malta in America. And whether you're a white president in the United States, whether you're a Kiwi in England or on the continent, whether you are a ruler in China or in Japan, and in fact, the emperor of Japan is a Bilderberger, and what is fascinating to me is that Obama had to bow down to him lower than he is. Do you know how to far he had to bow down? He almost touched his toes with his nose. So here they are honoring the popes and the presidents of the world bowing down to the popes. And the pope calls for a new world order. And Pope Benedict has proposed a new world political authority with real teeth. In the same year, same day, Obama seeks a new international order. Don't you think they are receiving their marching orders from the same source? On the same day, interesting hand signs that the Pope made at that stage. And now we have this Pope. And Time magazine says he's the new world Pope. And I'm fascinated by the turn of history and how rapidly prophecy is fulfilling. Because this man is achieving what God had separated through eons. He's unifying. And very soon they will all speak out of one mouth. And the question is, where do you stand? Do you go along with the norms and standards and laws of this society, contrary to the law of God, or do you stand by God? What happened in the Middle Ages if you decided to stick with the Bible and the Bible only? You became subject to the Inquisition. You were in serious trouble. 
And the Bible predicts a time of trouble such as never was. But there are beautiful promises in the Bible. A thousand will fall by your side. Ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come near you. Your bread and water shall be sure. My God will supply all your needs. Do you believe it? Or is it lip service? How will God separate those who really believe from those who don't? Because doesn't he say, when he returns, will he find faith? And how do you determine faith? To stand by the promises of God and to believe him even if the odds are against him. Now in the next lectures we will see how it unfolds and how legislation will be enacted totally contrary to the law of God, which already we have seen tonight is being implemented all over the world, but push will come to shove and we will have to make a decision. And may God help us as we contemplate prophecy and where we stand in the stream of time. But the good news is, God gave history in advance. And he says, see, I tell you, ahead of time, so that when it does happen, you will believe. May God bless you until we see each other tomorrow. Thank you.